A hundred years ago, cars appeared on Midlands roads, and within a decade, an industry was born. At one time, it was said that when car workers sneezed, the rest of the Midlands workforce caught a cold. But things have changed, and in the centenary year, we ask, what is the future for the motor industry? Good evening from the Heritage Motor Centre at Gaydon in Warwickshire, where tonight, at the start of the motor industry centenary year, I'm joined by a most distinguished panel to discuss the issues and challenges facing both the car and the industry in the years ahead. We'll be meeting them shortly. But before we look forward, what is it that's made 1896 to 1996 so special to the Midlands? There's always been debate as to when the motor industry began. But there's no doubt that the repeal of the restrictive four mile an hour Red Flag Act in 1896 liberated the then infant industry. From Herbert Austin's early experiments with just three wheels, Midland manufacturers continued to lead the way. With production ideas borrowed from the States, they went from strength to strength. This part of the world has since been responsible for some of the most famous names in car history, many of them on view here at the Heritage Motor Center. And that's why we've come here to the Heritage Motor Centre to discuss what is facing the motor industry. Would you like to meet my guests? First of all, there's Roger King, the Director of Public Affairs from the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, the SMMT. He's Chairman of the British Motor Industry Centenary Trust. We have Sue Baker, the very well-known freelance motoring journalist. You've read her work in Money Observer and Saga, amongst others. Professor Kumar Bhattacharya, an engineer, a director of Warwick Manufacturing Group at Warwick University, an advisor to the government on science and technology. We have Roger Higman, a transport campaigner with Friends of the Earth. He's also a cyclist. Carl Ludwigsen is a former luminary at General Motors, Ford and Fiat. He's head of the Ludwigsen Associates. He's compiler of Euromotor Reports, classic car expert, and former Zack Speed racing driver. And finally, Nick Stevenson, the director of design and engineering at the Rover Group. He's based at Gaydon. Well, the centenary year got underway yesterday with the service of Coventry Cathedral and a rather fine celebration banquet. Both events raised quite an outcry in some circles, but also generated quite a bit of publicity. We'll be discussing environmental and transport matters a little later on, but to begin with, Roger King, what's your reaction to the protests and what can we look forward to in the industry? Well, let's make one thing absolutely clear. We were not celebrating the motor car or the motor vehicle as such. We were celebrating a great industry, an industry that's provided enormous number of jobs, millions and millions over the last 100 years, and colossal wealth for this country. It's pro helped us prevail over two world wars, and as I say, has created wealth for this country to survive the post-war uh, economic climate. But what and are you ashamed of? Why shouldn't you celebrate the motor car? Most of us do. Why, why are you hiding from it? Well, of course, by implication, of course, in, in celebrating the industry, we do, of course, recognize the products we make. Uh, and yesterday we uh, applauded those products. But essentially we're talking about an industry and what it means in particular to the Midlands economic region. Are you celebrating Roger Higman? No, we're not celebrating. I think we have to remember that 1896 wasn't only the start of the motor industry, it was also the year that the first person in this country was killed by a motor car. And the industry for some reason doesn't seem to have put that date, 17th of August, in its celebratory programme. If you look at what the car is doing to society, you can see that from the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land itself, all of those areas are being adversely affected by the amount we drive and the amount of cars that are being manufactured. That's no cause for celebration. We recognize the triumphs of the industry and the achievements of the workers involved, but we think the industry has to get its celebration in perspective and actually look at that damage as well as looking at the Okay, Roger. The motor industry is the Midlands' biggest employer, with one in five people dependent on it for their livelihood in car components, manufacturer, 
sales, service, insurance and the like. No one needs to tell you that it's vitally important to our region. Here's a brief overview of the current state of play from our business and industry correspondent, Mark Foster. We may be celebrating the British motor industry, but the fact is all the major manufacturers in the Midlands are now in foreign ownership. Rover by BMW in Germany, Jaguar by Ford in the US, Peugeot by the French, and of course Toyota by the Japanese. Rover is our largest manufacturer with over 40,000 workers. They're halfway through a major investment program which will take them into the next century. They have plans for a brand new engine factory in the West Midlands and their latest model, the Rover 200, is competing with both Vauxhall's Astra and Peugeot's 306. This time last year, Peugeot were denying rumours that their Coventry plant was going to close. Since then, they've announced a £20 million turnaround in their fortunes. Peugeot says this reflects a 30% improvement at the factory, previously described by the French as one of their least efficient. The reward, a new super mini planned to join the 306 at the Wrighton plant. Jaguar, owned by Ford, employs about 7,000 people, most of them at the assembly plant in Coventry. A worrying period when the quality of the car was in serious doubt is now over. Productivity is up 50% and sales last year were up a third on 1994, with the company selling nearly 40,000 cars. But more significant is the development behind me. It's here that Jaguar is to build its mid-range model, the X200, won for Castle Bromwich against strong competition from a Ford factory in Detroit. Everyone is watching the Japanese. At Toyota, they've ended months of bitter wrangling between rival trades unions and recognized the AWU as the sole negotiator. With its emphasis on the role of shop floor workers in decision making, the Toyota workforce plays its part in what's being described as a revolution in Midlands manufacturing. Recently, the company confirmed stage two at Berniston, which will double current production. The car components industry depends on this expansion. Triplex supply 100,000 windscreens to Toyota alone, and the new Jaguar will generate thousands of automotive jobs. Companies like Rover acknowledge they must adapt to survive and there's a body of opinion that the competition posed by the Japanese will ultimately help the car makers already here. This is one of 116 quality circles at Land Rover in Solihull, a scheme involving employees in decision making and rewarding them accordingly. At Solihull the discovery goes from strength to strength. There's a new small Land Rover on the drawing board and four-wheel drive always makes money for the Rover group. But it's not such good news for the three-wheeled car makers. The gates of Reliant in Tamworth closed before Christmas as the company reached its third financial crisis in five years. Most of the workers have since been made redundant and the company put up for sale. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty. Sue Baker, what are car sales like? Car sales are not, are not as good as the industry would like them to be, but they are picking up. The unfortunate thing about car sales at the moment is it's companies who are buying and the private buyer who is nervous of buying a new car because of the state of the economy. Would you go along with that, Carl Ludwigson? I'd say that we're enjoying a two million car sales year roughly, and that's not bad. It's, it's pretty good, really. And the, the, the problem is that the industry hasn't restructured itself on the sales and distribution side to man manage that kind of sale level uh, in the proper way. And that's where the pressure is really coming on the sales side. It's in restructuring distribution, marketing, and dealerships in order to live with a, a two million car uh, year, which is not a bad volume of vehicles. Our problem is we're not managing that sales well enough. But if, as you say, there is some degree of uncertainty in the industry, Nick, how do you plan ahead? Well, firstly, I'd like to add to Carl's point, because he focused upon the, the UK market. Um, of course, uh, many of the British manufacturers are aggressive exporters, and we are seeing growing markets in many of our export territories. So I think business for the industry is looking to be very good in the future. Can we turn to foreign ownership? And can I ask you, Professor Kuma Bhattacharya, is that a problem for us here in this country? Is there that bigger foreign ownership to worry us? Well, not really, because although the cars may be, the car assemblers may be foreign, but the suppliers, uh, the supply chain is uh, very much British. Furthermore, uh, I think uh, we have a lot of small and medium-sized 
research and technology companies who are serving the world in the design and manufacturing techniques for cars. Well, I think technologically we haven't lost very much. Roger King, do you believe that foreign manufacturers worrying us here? Well, no, I don't think so. Uh, if you look at the state of manufacturing of cars in the UK, there are something like 21 car manufacturers making type approved cars and nine commercial vehicle and bus producers. Now, if you add that lot up, that's more than the rest of the manufacturers in the European Union. It is true that eight of those manufacturers are all foreign-owned and produced about 98% of the cars that we make. But the other 2% represents a kaleidoscope of colouring, colourful motoring manufacturers. Firms like Aston Martin, TVR, Morgan, that are producing products which the world wants. Now, both you and I remember the bad old days, trouble at Longbridge and the rest of it those days behind us? Largely yes, I believe so. I think what we have got now is a, a reformed period of uh, uh, industrial relations where the confrontational aspects have now gone. That's largely the result of the Japanese coming into the UK and we've taken their techniques and anglicised them if you like so that now the concept of team working where management and shop floor work together is preeminent. When I was involved with the uh, DTI we used to worry a lot, and I want to talk to you about this car, we used to worry a lot about quality, etc. Uh, but that was before just in time and that sort of thing. There were new practices coming in all the time, aren't there? In that respect, it's certain that the presence of the Japanese makers in the UK with their techniques of ordering parts, uh, setting standards of quality, is very beneficial to the system. But I would like to stress the importance of the suppliers here in the Midlands. The boss of BMW, who I understand carries a certain amount of weight in this part of the country, uh, said in the future, the success of the motor industry will be a partnership between suppliers and the car makers. And frankly, the industry will go where the good suppliers are. So we really need to support our supplier community here in this part of Britain. Well, looking at the industry as a whole, Sue, do you think we're beginning to get it right on the shop floor? I think we're certainly getting it right on the shop floor. Quality has improved dramatically over the past decade. I think we're also getting it right in design terms. I mean, a car like the MGF behind you, which caused ripples around the world when it was announced, shows that Britain still has the, the nous and the design talent to shock the world and excite the world with, with, uh, with their motor cars. We have a number of small companies operating in this country as well, don't we, uh, Professor? Um, who do you think is making the most impression? Well, I think if you look at racing cars for that matter, I mean, Britain has got this sort of technology these days that can beat the world. So uh, the, 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 the problem of uh, uh, supply chain in, in UK has got to be handled, of course, because although the assemblers have learned from the Japanese, but let me tell you, in the 1920s, GIT and quality techniques where they're not so far away from here at Longbridge, where for the first time you could see the small suppliers next to the assembly line and they would supply it. So I think what we are now seeing, a re-emergence of what we used to do here in the 1920s and the 1930s, you see. So I think what we should be careful about is when we talk about foreign ownership and when we talk about our car industry as a whole, there's an immense amount of knowledge base and willingness now, which we lost in the 60s and the 70s. Now, we're doing well with uh, sales abroad as well, aren't we, Nick? And don't feel left out, Roger. I'm coming to you in the second part. Yes, indeed we are. Uh, I'm pleased to say it's not only in the mature markets, such as the United States. Uh, of course, Europe is an export territory. Uh, and um, the British-made cars are doing extremely well in all parts of Europe, but also in, um, in the Far East. And it's very pleasing to see us having success in Japan, where once the trade was only in one direction, of course. What I'm pleased to say now is the appeal of British cars, which stand apart from the Japanese mass-produced vehicles, are now having a great deal of success. Thanks a lot. Now, as Roger will doubtless be telling us in the next part of the programme, you've only got to look at the protests against things like Newbury's Western Bypass to see that cars and roads are generating ongoing antagonism, and not only from a handful of NIMBYs either. The motor vehicle is under serious attack and people are demanding that something is done about it before it's too late. Here's a report from our transport correspondent, Peter Plisner. Most people agree there are too many cars on the roads, but few of us want to give them up. Better public transport is one of the answers, 
but improvements are a long time in coming. What's needed are integrated services with more frequent buses, systems to keep waiting travellers informed and dedicated lanes with priority at traffic lights. Trams or trains linked to park and ride can offer a choice to those who can't shake off the auto addiction. A new system in Sheffield is now up and running, Midland Metro in Birmingham and a scheme in Nottingham are also being promoted. If we can't give up our cars, we could drive greener, use less foot on the pedal and keep cars properly serviced. We could share them. Nottingham City Council has plans including car share, which could cut employee car use by up to a third. Are we using the safest fuel? Recent reports have highlighted the dangers of particulates. It's good to know there are alternatives available. This pump delivers city diesel from Sainsbury's. It's a bit more expensive, but it can cut some emissions by up to 60%. We need to get the Smoky Joes off the road. Tougher standards at the annual MOT test should catch the 10% of vehicles responsible for 50% of the pollution. So what about the electric car? Peugeot showed us the ION at the motor show, and a trial of electric cars in French cities comes to Coventry later this year with a battery-powered Peugeot 106. What have other car makers got to offer? Special Ford Mondeo smog eaters are on test in Europe. New catalyst technology can turn car radiators into pollutant-destroying air filtration systems. In Ireland, they offer a £1,000 relief on new car tax if a car at least 10 years old is scrapped. But is this the most efficient way of dealing with them? Between 5 and 10% of the pollution a car causes during its lifetime is created when it's scrapped. Much better, surely, to recycle. Meanwhile, something has to be done about the sheer volumes of traffic. In the long run, it seems, get tough policies may be the only answer. There's ever more talk about road pricing. We already have tolls on some roads and bridges, and we've recently seen higher taxes on fuel. Perhaps we should all get on our bikes, but it needs safe cycling routes and real incentives. Leicester City Council pays its pedal-pushing employees 40 pence a mile, and under-road loops give bicycles priority at some traffic lights. With suggestions of more tax on company cars and a possible tax on company parking spaces, it may soon be too expensive to use our cars anyway. A prospect that should please those who felt that yesterday's service should have acknowledged the environmental damage caused by the car and the people who've died because of it. I'm here because we lost our son in a road traffic accident due to a young speeding driver last February. And I think it's obscene for a religious ceremony to be held for basically a piece of metal, and a piece of metal that's killing people. This cathedral has always, at the centre of Car City, taken seriously the responsibilities we have in manufacturing these instruments of death, which is what they are at one level. Well, I think many people will be concerned at the idea of bringing a car down the aisle of a cathedral. This is really turning Coventry Cathedral into a car showroom for the benefit of the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders and to sell cars. It's a quite inappropriate use for a place of worship. Now, just a minute. I like my car. Why should I ride a bike, which would look ridiculous? Or why should I get in this filthy, stinking old bus, Roger? Well, with traffic set to double over the next 35 years, there is little doubt that we're facing an environmental disaster in this country if we don't get car use under control. Pollution will continue as it is at the moment. Uh, damage to the countryside will increase massively. R road runoff from, of heavy metals into, the, into river systems will increase. And a whole variety of environmental problems that vehicle manufacture and vehicle use cause will get worse. Roger, we've been hearing these scare stories for years. Are we supposed to really take them seriously? I think we are supposed to take them seriously. I think if you look at the success of the anti-road movement over the last couple of years, you'll see that a growing body of people in this country are sick and tired of people arguing that the motor industry's needs have to take precedence over the environment. What we're interested in is not getting rid of the car, but trying to find ways of encouraging the alternatives such that we can live with the car rather than let the car destroy our lives. Kumar, would you go along with any of that, or is he talking nonsense? Well, I'll go along with a part of it, but uh, I think like everything else, in the pendulum, he wants to swing the pendulum a bit too far. I think what's going to happen, I think people are very concerned, obviously, about environmental issues. But what's important here is not a question of saying, well, we shouldn't have any cars, how do we solve it? And I think there'll be about three different 
ways in which people are going to handle it and are handling it. One will be regulatory, whereby uh, more and more is known about the effects of pollution and hence one will be able to identify areas where we should have regulation. Secondly, it will be infrastructure and part of which you saw in the film, whereby alternative methods of transport and, 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 and better roads and, ro and bypasses will happen. But whenever, thirdly, they, thirdly. whenever they tell us about alternative, I'll get to the third in a minute, whenever they tell us about better modes of transport, they show us these beautiful new vehicles. Get out, get out where everybody else is. They're filthy, dirty things. But you know, they, 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 let, me, let me tell you what, what I think people are doing, what car designers are doing. One is, how do we reduce the weight of cars, first of all, to reduce pollution? Okay? You're not going to get rid of cars, and you're not going to get alternative uh, methods of transport overnight. We have to try and solve the problems currently. So we are going to reduce the weight of cars, and that's already happening. We are going to get better engines by better control, by better electronic control, and combination of regulatory and infrastructure, I think, will handle majority of the problems that we are facing All today. right. Let's go to the obvious man, Nick Stevenson. Uh, you're going to design smaller, lighter, more economical cars, are you? Yes, yes indeed we and are. And what about those of us who want to drive a big car? Well, you will also be able to have a big car. I don't think that the car... Cake and eat it, eh? Absolutely so. I think, first of all, I'd like to make it clear that I don't think that the, the car designers can, um, can solve at source all social ills. We have to respond to customer tastes, and of course that is precisely what we'll continue to do. Uh, having said that, we are very, very well aware of environmental issues. Kumar summarised one or two of the technologies that we're already using to improve the efficiency and economy of our vehicles, and there are many, many more things to come. He didn't mention improvements in communication systems, which will vastly reduce um, traffic jams, improve traffic flow, with, uh, with monitors on the road giving uh, advanced warning of traffic queuing, uh, flashing information to vehicle navigation systems so you can avoid those queues, many, many ways of increasing the actual efficiency of the vehicle on the road. Well, we always pay lip service, don't we? We pay lip service to the environment. But to Carl, do we really, deep in our heart, give a damn? We're very concerned that the chap next door to us should buy an environmentally <laughs> sensitive car, and, uh, but we're less concerned about it ourselves. However, the industry has to step up to this, and I, I guess I'd like to issue a challenge to Nick and his colleagues for the, the next hundred years, which is to commence work immediately, seriously, and profoundly on a really, really good electrically powered vehicle. We need a sound, usable electric vehicle. We are in the right country for it. We have commercial vehicles uh, that are electrically powered. We have an infrastructure. Our driving patterns in Britain are ideal for electric vehicles. This is a country that should be taking the lead in electric vehicles. Instead, we're letting France, the US, Japan, and others do it. I hope we'll really get to grips with that. Let me ask Sue, how practical is that? Not practical enough yet, unfortunately. Electric vehicles are improving all the time, but they are not as much fun to drive. They are they're very worthy, but they, they are not a replacement yet for the motor car. And unfortunately, there's a danger that we forget. You are removing the pollution from the point where the car is being used. You're not removing it ultimately because you still have dirty power stations producing that energy. So we have to get it in the, in the whole context, not just where the cars are being used. Having said that, I think there is scope in, in the foreseeable future for perhaps small fleets of electric city cars on a self-hire taxi basis to be one of the solutions to the city problems that we have with the motor car. But why is it that the motorist is hated so much, Roger King? The government hates us, local government hates us, road tax, car parking, road pricing, bus lanes, God knows they hate us. Well, governments and local governments certainly don't hate the motorists because they use the income from the road user uh, to fuel their government plans of expenditure. The Treasury in the UK takes something like £25 billion a year away from the motorist uh, and spends a very small portion of that on the infrastructure needed to unclog our roads and provide pollution-free transport. Roger, it looks like you're going to win. I think in the end we'll all have to get on bikes or walk. I quite, hate the thought. Quite possibly, I don't know. What is certain is that if the industry doesn't clean it up its act and produce cleaner vehicles, more fuel-efficient vehicles, more recyclable vehicles, the pressure for government action 
by an angry public concerned about this, the industry's environmental effects will grow louder and louder. Let's look at the future. Once round the table, we'll start with Nick Stevenson. Nick, the future of the industry. Well, I think it's extremely healthy and challenging. And I think we'll be producing exciting, efficient, high technology cars that are going to bring back the pleasure of motoring. Carl Ludwigson. Well, as Kumar said, we have tremendous creativity in the British industry. We need creativity to produce advanced designs. With creativity, there are three other things we need to, to have a superior industry in Britain. Quality, quality, and quality. Simple as that. Simple as that. Then I'm going to go to Sue by my side. Sue, the future of the industry. People want motor cars. The car isn't going to go away. The industry has to refine it further to make it more livable with more tolerable in environmental terms. But it's, it's cloud cuckoo land to say that we scrap the motor car. Cloud cuckoo land, Professor Kumar. You don't think it's cloud cuckoo land either, do you? No, certainly not. I mean, I think we are seeing the start of the second industrial revolution of cars in this country. Uh, with three quarters of the people in the world not having proper transport and we having the sort of technology and seeing the change in our structure and the quality of our cars, the future is pretty rosy. And Roger, you don't think it's got any future at all, do you? I think the car industry has a future, uh, but I think, as Sue said, it's in making cleaner, more fuel efficient, more easily recyclable cars. And we also have to recognise that a balance has to be struck between the car and the other forms of transport so that we don't damage the environment. Let's finish with the man from the SOMT, Roger King. I agree entirely with what Roger has just said. The two Rogers agree. We need to invest in public transport. We need to produce more environmentally friendly cars. And that's what the Midlands motor industry is certainly going to do. It's never been better placed to tackle the problems of the future. We have excellent factories, excellent work people, and the future for the next millennium couldn't be better. I was going to say, into the 21st century, it's looking good? Yes, I think so. By the time we get there, we'll be making more cars than ever before. But there'll be cars that not only do customers want but the environment rightly demands. Now how are you going to do that? Cloud cuckoo land isn't it? Now once you start bringing the environment in again you're making all the right noises but you don't mean it. Of course we do. We're going to make better buses. We're going to make better cars, more fuel efficient cars. You've heard from Nick, you've heard from uh, Carl that we can make these alternative fuel vehicles uh, and we need to redouble our efforts to make sure that's what we do. Well if I may thank you very much Roger King and can I thank you all for being so kind as to join us here this evening. That's it. We've got a year of commemoration ahead. If you'd like to have your say, I'd like to hear from you on Report Back on your local radio station. But now, from the Heritage Motor Centre at Gaydon, it's good night.